why don't you go ahead and let us know. Hey, Diego, thank you for inviting me uh, to do this. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk about Samurai Wallet too much today, uh, only a little bit at the end uh, and a little bit at the beginning. Um, what I want to talk today about is, is why we're building Samurai and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and, and to give a, a little bit of a broader uh, insight into some of the decisions we make and, and why we do the things we do. Uh, so the title uh, of this its talk is called uh, Building a Digital Safe Haven. Uh, before we get into that, let's do a quick introduction for, for those of you who might not be aware of what Samurai Wallet is or who we are. So Samurai Wallet started in uh, 2015, Bitcoin Wallet, uh, with a very small team of two. Uh, myself, which is the intern or Samurai or wallet guy sometimes, and my co-founder, uh, TDevD, the deliberator, Samurai Dev. Today we have a core team of nine people, um, but back then it was just two. So we had a small footprint, but we had big goals. And along with big goals, we had big red lines. Uh, we've always had a, a pretty strong ideological bent. Uh, it's really what kind of pushed us into this thing. So some things just cannot be crossed. So deep in, uh, deeper into the early footprint, uh, we started in May 2015, full Bitcoin wallet, AKA a private key manager, uh, closed alpha testing group of around 100 people, uh, growing to maybe around two or 300 people before we opened it up in 2016. No KYC, no exceptions. This is one of those red lines we were talking about. Non-custodial, no exceptions, another one of the red line. Uh, from the start, we've had a strong focus on uh, Bitcoin on-chain privacy while transacting specifically. Uh, we've always sought to deliver strong defaults, privacy defaults, uh, novel features, and experiment with uh, breaking heuristics that are, are known uh, to be used when surveilling the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, so even back then at our earliest inception, that we were playing around with these, these concepts and these ideas. Looking at Samurai Wallet today, uh, we have over 125,000 downloads on the Google Play Store in early access and some other amount in direct download APKs and some other amount in uh, built from source uh, APK. So we don't have a, a, an exact amount, but we know it's, it's a lot more than we ever expected. Uh, and of course, the famous when 1.0 question. I think this year we, we actually surpassed uh, Gmail for I think longest beta program ever. Uh, so we're still in beta. We'll get to 1.0 when it's ready. Uh, today, we have the only stealth address implementation uh, in any Bitcoin wallet or in the Bitcoin ecosystem at all. Um, we have a coordinated Chalmian coin join, which we call Whirlpool. We have peer-to-peer -peer coin joins, uh, which we call Cahoots, a couple different types of transactions. We'll get into those a little later. We have decoy coin joins. We have a uh, full coin control within the Bitcoin wallet. You have the ability to connect your own full node, of course. Um, the ability to create off and broadcast offline transactions. And a new Tor-based uh, communication layer called Sorabon, which will bring about some interesting privacy uh, features in the future and also improve some of the ones we have uh, existing today. So let's get back to the, the meat of this actual, this actual talk, which is building a digital safe heaven. So before we can actually talk about and explain what a digital safe haven is, we have to look at examples of safe havens in meat space in real life. Uh, so let's talk about one of the first and uh, most famous meat, uh, meat space safe havens in the world, uh, existing from about the 1700s to 2012. I'm talking, of course, of the Swiss, world famous Swiss banks. So the highlights of the Swiss safe haven. Starting in the 1700s, uh, Council of Geneva outlawed the disclosure of information about the uh, European upper class. This was, of course, mostly to prevent the information of Catholics going to the uh, primarily Protestant banks. Um, still, privacy. Uh, in the 1910s, uh, the Swiss bankers traveled to France explicitly to advertise its, its banking secrecy during the First World War. In the 20s, uh, Swiss bankers gain a reputation 
for refusing to help foreign governments track down tax evaders of the newly formed income taxes, which were, uh, like I said, newly formed and, and much hated. In the 30s, uh, Swiss legislators made bank secrecy actually part of federal Swiss law, even though we had a, a history of bank secrecy within, uh, within the country and among the people. It was actually in 1934 that it became part of Swiss uh, federal law with Article 47 disclosing a, bank's custom, a bank customer's identity to a foreign government is a criminal act. And most, most interestingly, cash custodians who did not maintain absolute silence, and that was a direct quote, about their client's financial information would face imprisonment and government fines. So this was enshrined in legislation. And in the 1940s, uh, the Swiss protected uh, German Jewish assets along with Nazi gold and cash balances. So what happened? Well, all good things must come to an end. Uh, in 2008 was a very bad year for uh, the Swiss. So early 2008, the Swiss, uh, the Swiss signed uh, onto the European Union Savings Directive. This requires them to report, quote unquote, non-identifying tax statistics to uh, EU member countries. So somewhat anonymized or pseudonymous records. And also in 2008, uh, one of the largest Swiss banks, UBS, was implicated in a, a major tax evasion scandal in the US. And um, as part of an agreement with the Department of Justice, disclosed uh, information on 4,000 clients uh, to the Department of Justice, uh, presumably uh, US customers. And in uh, 2012, of course, Switzerland signed on to the US uh, FACTA which requires the same type of non-identifying uh, tax statistics to the IRS. Um, technically, there was a way it, it, you could opt out of this reporting, but practically what actually ended up happening was that every Swiss bank bar one uh, just refuses to serve US customers anymore. And um, that's one very effective way <laughs> of, um, of impacting a, a safe haven. So we can say, thanks, Obama. So we've learned a little bit about safe havens. We have an example uh, in history of, of what a meat space safe haven looks like. So we can start saying, okay, how can, how, in order to build a digital safe haven, we need, to, we need to see what can we recreate, what properties can we recreate? Um, so one of the most important things we, we learned from the historical uh, bullet points is the obscured identity. Privacy was, was paramount uh, for the, for these uh, Swiss banks. And it was so paramount, it was enshrined in law. Um, strength in numbers, again. Uh, a culture, a very strong culture of banking secrecy going back hundreds of years, um, in addition to legislative action, gave the Swiss the numbers they needed to, uh, and the stability they needed to have this type of system. Uh, censorship resistance. Well, if they don't know who you are, it's pretty hard to censor you. Another very important point, bearer based assets. It was, it was very explicit in the legislation that custodians of cash balances had this duty to maintain secrecy. It was very important cash, uh, which is of course a bearer based, uh, asset, uh, fungibility. Uh, this was demonstrated beautifully by uh, the fact that the Swiss were quite happy to take Jewish and Nazi gold and store it in the same vaults. Um, your gold is good here. And uh, a high barrier to surveil. Again, this goes mostly towards a uh, culture of Swiss bankers themselves having a, one could say, a type of code, a professional code where it's, it's deeply shameful to share the records of your clients and um, also going towards legislation, making it a criminal act to provide this information, creates a high barrier of, uh, to surveil. Now, what can we do to improve this model uh, in the digital realm? Because uh, it makes no sense to just, to just take the, uh, take everything over without improving things. So one, one issue, uh, of course, is that Swiss banks were very high barrier of entry, needed to be very wealthy, uh, and you needed to have the ability to uh, move freely uh, in and out of the country. Uh, so we, if ideally, a digital safe haven 
would lower the barrier to entry to virtually as many people as possible. Um, a digital safe haven should focus on reducing and or eliminating counterparty risk whenever possible. Uh, ultimately, that's what what um, caused the downfall of the Swiss safe haven is that there were third parties. Uh, we were relying on legislation. We were relying on on culture. Um, and ultimately, those things will fail over time. So re reducing those counterparties that can fail is going to be important in the digital system. And of course, we want it to be permissionless. Um, the Swiss system wasn't necessarily permission heavily, but it wasn't permissionless. Uh, and I think we can, we can improve on that. So how do we translate this into a digital safe haven? Well, like I said, obscured identity is essential. Uh, uh, legislative attempts to enforce this will ultimately fail. There will always be bigger and stronger legislatures with more guns. Uh, digital doesn't have the ability even to create legislation, even if it did work. So we must find alternative methods of enforcement of these obscured identities. And that could be cryptographic systems, encryption schemes, and hard to change protocols. True names. Easy to create new identities on demand. This is an interesting concept. Um, this adds towards the low barrier to entry and permissionless aspects. Um, strong avoidance of personally identifiable information. So what Werner Vinge would call your true name. For if they know your true name, they can get you to do their bidding, which was one of the concepts of this book. And if, if you haven't read this book, I, I highly recommend it. It's one of the cypherpunk uh, classics. Another aspect is the bearer based cash. Uh, the primary and dominant money of the economy has to be bearer based with no central issuer. This is uh, one of the most essential aspects, actually. Uh, again, the central issuer, the legislature, the bank, central bank, these can all be targeted. These, these can all be manipulated and these will uh, ultimately fail in terms of if you're going to rely on them to uh, enforce your privacy and enforce your economic freedom. Uh, the current fiat, uh, the fiat money system currently is, is unsuitable for use within the digital safe haven. Uh, this is because of multiple reasons. You have the Patriot Act in the U.S., you have FACTA, you have suspicious activity reporting, you have the crime of unexplained wealth, you have the war on cash, you have draconian AML and KYC encroachments. Uh, and it's only getting worse. Uh, future digital national fiat currency will even uh, be even more unsuitable. Um, and time isn't on our side at this. So self-regulating economy this is another aspect of the digital safe haven and this is the scariest one and this uh this is the one that generally gets the most attention in the press uh there's very little to no government regulatory oversight within the digital safe haven no bailouts if shits hit the fan uh requires street smarts quote unquote uh to navigate successfully but what this all ultimately uh results in after trial and error is a natural navigation towards systems uh, that diminish counterparty risk, that diminish um, uh, custodianship of, of either your identity or your funds. And going towards that non-custodial, the biggest advantage is the ability to self-custody with relative ease. So this is something that was not possible in the Swiss system. You had to trust the custodian, the Swiss bank. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore. Uh, it eliminates the counterparty risk, adds to the permissionless of the system, and uh, the ultimate level of control is placed on the individual where it belongs. So it's the economy, stupid. A safe haven requires a safe money, and a digital safe haven requires a safe digital money. Digital currencies offer great promise, much like the internet did and does. Um, to be the monetary powerhouse, the economic unit uh, underpinning this economy, but it also offers the possibility of creating uh, a draconian health, uh, hellscape 
that uh, is far worse than what we experience today. So with that being said, how do we avoid making those mistakes of the past? Let's look at the internet as we know it today. Uh, a revolutionary tool did change the world and has the potential to still change the world. But that potential has been captured by regulatory and special interests. And it has already been leveraged into new chains, as I put it here in this slide, uh, to replace the old ones that it disrupted. 1998, the IFWP was um, established to create the rules of the uh, ICANN. Uh, this was done very much in the same way that the bit process uh, is done on Bitcoin. And I'm sure it's a very similar um, process exists for Monero. Um, what happened was the main industry participants during this event uh, boycotted it and refused to participate and instead created their own draft bylaws uh, and rules that became the official bylaws and rules uh, of the internet. In 2002, ICANN eliminated the one board position of the quote unquote internet user. So this was the representative that was supposed to represent our interests. Um, and also in 2002, the Internet Society revised their bylaws to ensure that the governance of said society would actually no, no longer be controlled entirely by the board, but would actually be controlled by the two largest corporate members of the board. Um, well, 2010s to today, well, we know what Edward Snowden uh, disclosed. We've seen the extreme levels of cooperation of industry participants, uh, even unlawful um, cooperation in some cases. Uh, the W3C very controversially enabled DRM as a web standard by secret vote. Uh, we still don't know the actual results of that vote. This again is a process that was supposed to be very much like the bit process of Bitcoin, which is a consensus based um, system that's gone away. The FCC's net neutrality, this may be controversial, but I see this as a threat. The EU with their GDPR, I appreciate the the goal, uh, and I don't I don't appreciate uh, the implementation. Uh, the quote unquote internet as a public utility. Again, I get where where people are coming from, uh, but beware beware what you ask for. Um, only Warren G can regulate me. So, that being said, on the digital. Uh, safe haven side. Talk is cheap. And the whole point of that, that introduction to, to how we view uh, what this can be is to, to get into why we built what we built. So let's talk about building on Bitcoin first. I'm very conscious that I am a guest of the Monero village and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, but we're not a Monero wallet, we're a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, and we do see Bitcoin as a good uh, albeit not perfect form of money for the digital safe, uh, safe haven economy. Uh, first mover advantage, large existing user base and most likely to grow in the future. Despite uh, the regulatory capture that exists on the on and off ramps like exchanges, uh, the protocol has shown robustness uh, for over a decade. I think today is the, the 12th uh, birthday of the white paper. Um, it's a bearer asset, which is an essential aspect. Uh, at least it is at its pure level on the protocol and it's synonymous, uh, which uh, it's not anonymous, but it, it can work. The bad, and there is bad, but the bad offers an opportunity to provide value to builders uh, like ourselves. So there's uh, the bad, strong attitude of compliance within this industry, uh, which can and has led to regular, uh, regulatory capture. Uh, transparent ledger, we, no one can deny it. Uh, Anyone, including your adversaries, can see your, your transaction history, uh, if you, especially if you're using Bitcoin without any, any sort of privacy enhancing technologies. Um, in a fully synonymous system, it's not a huge deal, um, but it's a huge deal when it's combined with K, uh, KYC AML records, which when we jump back to the previous uh, bullet point, of strong regulatory capture events, it's kind of uh, a tempest in a teapot there, or a, or a, uh, a serious issue is developing. Um, 
another issue that I see is a strong retail investment focus that has distorted the use case of Bitcoin from useful money uh, to a speculative investment. Uh, this kind of damages the, the culture. It's not a serious long-term consideration. Uh, it's the digital safe haven economy doesn't really matter. It doesn't care about these externalities, but it is something that builders need to be, uh, like ourselves, need to be aware of. Um, the pr uh, prevalent attitudes of consumers. That being said, what we're talking about Samurai Wallet, we look at Samurai the software as the gateway to this digital safe haven economy. Uh, so going right at the start, the on-ramp area, you start with your fiat currency, you use some sort of exchange, OTC or broker to exchange into and, and to sell out and to back into fiat. This is called the on and off ramp. The wallet sits outside of this area. You send your digital currency to the wallet, you send the digital currency out of the wallet back to the broker, back into fiat currency. We call this the gateway. The other side of sending it out is sending it the other way uh, towards spending goods and services. And that can be loads of things, remittance, gambling, prepaid stuff, travel, shopping, VPN, hosting. Um, that goes back uh, that can go back into your wallet and every single one of these every single one of these providers and uh, service offers they use a wallet so profits revenues will go back into there and maybe go that way who knows um, the other option is the holding so you spend or hold savings and investments in other words um, from your wallet and that could be lots of things let's we've listed three here is asset protection company reserves, we've seen a couple of those events in Bitcoin recently, and capital investments, meaning using your savings and investments to build out products and services that people can use. Same thing that capital is used for in meat space. That's all stored in the wallet for savings and investments as well. And we call this area the digital safe haven. So everything that happens outside of the on and off ramp path through the gateway is what we're, what we're labeling this digital safe haven. So how do we do it? We think we're the best gateway to the digital safe haven. We have absolutely no meat space identity in the wallet, no KYC, no AML, no exceptions, no third party integrations with services that KYC or AML, even to our own detriment, we could have, we could have uh, earned some, some revenue by in integrating with certain services. We just can't do it. Um, low barrier to entry to participate. We had Android APK free open source software, no third party custodial risk. Everything's non-custodial all the time. We don't build any services custodial in any, in any way. Um, and increases the barrier of entry to surveil, which is a big claim and I hope to back it up. Uh, on the network side of things, Tor is, is uh, basic. Um, we use multiple encryption schemes for various different um, features and tools. Uh, and transaction privacy, which is really what we've focused on over the last um, number of years. Let's talk about Paynims real quick. Paynim is a, uh, it's based on BIP47, which, so it's, it's an open um, suggestion to the Bitcoin community to implement. No one else has implemented, or no one, a few people have implemented it, but they're no longer uh, viable, they're no longer around. We're the only ones that have it implemented currently. Um, so it's based on excellent work by uh, Justice Ranvier and the open source Bitcoin, or the open Bitcoin privacy project. Again, it's the only stealth address implementation uh, in Bitcoin. And it solves a major issue uh, that Bitcoin users have, which is sharing an address does reveal or can reveal um, prior history and will reveal future activity of those coins. Um, there's no way around that on a, on a public blockchain, except there kind of is with stealth address technology, which Monero users are familiar with anyway. Uh, so we have this in the wallet. Um, and it's like I said, it's it, it's a very, very early basis for a decentralized identity system. Whirlpool is our is our uh, Chalmian coordinated coin join. So this is a coin join implementation uh, available on desktop and mobile. That is the only one on Bitcoin to offer 100% entropy uh, mixes with zero deterministic links, meaning 
um, that the most amount of confusion that can arise and combinations that can arise between inputs and outputs of uh, a whirlpool mix is the most that can mathematically be in a whirlpool mix based on the number of inputs and outputs. Um, there, there, it couldn't be higher. Um, and zero deterministic links is, is pretty, pretty obvious. Um, you cannot uh, determine with any degree of certainty which um, input it corresponds to which output. That's what that means. Uh, the, the fee structure is flat, not a volume-based fee like most of these services that, that offer CoinJoin. Um, and it's, in, uh, it's actually designed to incentivize good post-mix behavior by the user after the initial mix event, which is important. Uh, it's obviously not custodial. We practice strict change output segregation. Address reuse is prevented. Uh, available on Mac OS and Linux. So these two for the Monero guys, you know, they, they're, they're going to laugh at these because these are Bitcoin specific. These are things that we have to do because again, the public ledger uh, with strict change output segregation and address reuse being prevented. Uh, oh. So here's an example of a Whirlpool transaction. Like I said, there's, um, five inputs, five outputs, and the number of combinations in a five input and five output transaction can only be 1,496, and that's how many there are. And if we were to increase it to 10 and 10, it would be still 100% with more possible interpretations. Stonewall is a, or it can be both a peer-to-peer -peer coin join or a decoy coin join with just yourself. Both per, uh, versions are indistinguishable from one another on the blockchain, which is part of the, the power of the feature. Uh, so again, it, it introduces entropy and number of combinations into transactions that would otherwise be deterministic. Um, it's a clever use of inputs and outputs to create transactions with many combinations. And um, the next slide is give a little bit more detail. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I will make the slide available so you can you can take a look at this in your in your leisure. And hold on. Shout out to uh, Bitcoin Q and A for putting these together. So Stowaway is another peer to peer coin join, but it actually looks like a standard Bitcoin transaction with two outputs, which would be the destination and change. Um, when in fact it's two participants. Um, Creating, working together to create this transaction. Um, it doesn't leave a specific fingerprint on the blockchain. In fact, it blends in. And as of the day we release stowaway, any simple transaction with two outputs can theoretically be a stowaway transaction. So it's a, it's a pretty strong undermining of the common ownership heuristic. Another side, side benefit of stowaway is the actual amount that you've transacted is not viewable on the blockchain. An amount is viewable, but it's not correct. Um, this was first um, theorized by Gregory, Gregory Maxwell on the Bitcoin talk forums, and we first implemented it um, early 2018. And later on, some other wallets would implement it, and now it's known uh, by them as PayJoin. So if you've heard of PayJoin, it's the same thing as Stowaway. And this is a stowaway transaction. Again, not going to go through it, but you can review it at your leisure. Ricochet is a transaction that adds distance between the origin and the destination of a transaction. Um, so this is primarily used to help users avoid proximity-based censorship. Uh, so this could be, you know, you 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 know, simped out on a, on OnlyFans and then tried to send to Coinbase, and Coinbase has a policy against pornography. Uh, they could theoretically lock your account. If you want to give Coinbase the ability to say, oh, well, eh, we don't think it's that close to, to porn, so we don't have to lock it, you could add hops of, of deniability to your transaction. Say, well, five hops ago, this transaction was close to something prohibited, but you know, five hops away is quite a bit, so they're okay now. Uh, it's it's our longest running um, feature, and it's very popular with users of third-party exchanges. And 
what a ricochet looks like. So this is actually different from a lot of our other tools where this isn't a a coin join. This isn't a isn't even trying really to hide that it's a ricochet. It's just literally putting distance uh, between the send and the receive side of things. Uh, TX Senna is a is a great um, offline broadcasting mechanism. So you create offline broad, uh, transaction with your Samurai wallet and then broadcast it over the mesh network uh, with uh, Gotenna. And last, uh, Soraban is our Tor-based encrypted communication layer, which is launching later uh, this month, or sorry, later in November. Um, it's Bitcoin agnostic, has nothing to do with cryptocurrency really at all. Uh, it can be used for a wide variety of communication between, uh, between peers. Um, we're using it in Samurai Wallet with the pay name Decentralized Identity to allow users to coordinate coin join transactions between themselves without requiring the use of a, of a centralized coordinator. And this has been released fully in a free and open source software. Oh, sorry, the now last, <laughs> I think. Uh, Dojo, uh, this was a big one, and that's why it's last. Dojo allows you to connect your full node to Samurai Wallet and, and run a full backing uh, node to prevent having to rely on our servers as your source of truth. So you don't have to rely on our servers to store your funds or anything like that, non-custodial, but you do have to rely on our servers unless you run Dojo to tell you the truth on the balance and the history of your, your transactions. Uh, it's easy DIY, or you can purchase a plug and play hardware version. It's Tor based, free open source software, like everything else. Um, and here's a couple photos. This is uh, some someone on Twitter, Econo Alchemist, I believe, set up their dojo and they're connected their phone to it. So wrapping things up, and I, I appreciate you letting me go through this with you guys. I hope I didn't bore you with it. Um, we believe the, the relative economic freedom that many of us take for granted today is rapidly disappearing. Um, digital currencies provide great promise, but they also prevent, uh, present new challenges. And we need to be realistic about what those challenges are and how we can handle them. Uh, we see Samurai Wallet uh, positioned as Bitcoin's best gateway into the, the digital safe haven economy. And thank you very much. Hey, thanks, man. Um, you said you'd be available for some questions after the fact. Um, I am monitoring the YouTube and the Discord. So if anybody has some questions they'd like to ask, please, by all means, put them in the chat and I'll read them. And if not, I may have some questions of my own that I'd like to discuss. Lay it on me. I'll give a minute for the peanut gallery to throw anything they'd like inside. But in the meantime, um, oh, you're still sharing your screen. We see all the things, bro. We see all the things. <laughs> okay. Um, one question that I do have is how accepting do you see the Bitcoin community to the privacy technologies that people like yourselves are making? Like, is 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 there any sort of urgency in the Bitcoin community at large? I mean, obviously, there's different pockets. So, like, there's going to be the pocket that does think it's important. It's urgent. We got to get on this. But kind of like in general, um, are you seeing kind of this urgency? Are you seeing this acceptance? Are you seeing a lot of people, you know, virtue signaling saying, yes, this is important, but then not really pitching up or doing anything themselves? Like, what what is that environment like? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I kind of touch on it a little bit. I, I, I do say that the you know the the large influx of retail investment over the last couple price hikes has diluted the um, the culture a little bit in terms of what people broadly are looking for. Um, Where as privacy may be actually considered by some of some of these people as um, as a threat to their investment. As opposed to as to something they should uh, they would be looking for. So it depends where you look. Um, I think if you're looking on Twitter and if you're looking on the main area like Reddit and the main areas, 
it's a lot of virtue signaling. It's a lot of nonsense. Um, it's a lot of number go up. Um, if you're within our Telegram community, it's a little bit different. People there, um, you know, it's not. What, what's interesting about, and I, I've thought a lot about this on the uh, on the Monero side of things, because a lot of our users are Monero users as well, and I've wondered about that. And I think that what it just comes down to is that actual participants in in what I've termed the you know this digital safe haven economy, they're not they're not driven by you know maximalism or or uh, this is this is the only good coin. They're driven by use case and utility. And if a coin is there that solves, you know, the, the use case, they're going to use it. So I, you know, I was very, very, I think I only mentioned Bitcoin just a few times in my talk, because it really wasn't about Bitcoin. It's about finding, you know, it's about the right money and it's about building those systems in the right way. What kind of money it is doesn't matter. And I think there will be a competition of money, um, you know, in that space as there should be. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I'm not a Bitcoin user myself necessarily. I mean, I use it when I have to interface with the real world several times because it is the one that has definitely the most real world adoption. But um, I, I do see the benefit of uh, projects like yours building privacy on Bitcoin, if nothing else to show how really hard and potentially impossible it might be. But uh, for, for other reasons as well, because maybe who knows, I don't know everything, you know, there may be some pretty big break breakthroughs that get decent adoption and show, oh, look, this is possible. Um, I'm personally skeptical, but that doesn't mean... Well, I, I, I'm skeptical as well, <laughs> if you're talking about the protocol level. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I think that even if we, we did see some, some breakthroughs, technological breakthroughs, I think it'd be very difficult to see them be deployed um, on the protocol level. And we, we kind of came to this conclusion really early on in 2015. And, and that was kind of why we started Samurai Wallet. Um, Cause it was like, well, if it's not going to happen on the protocol level, it at least should happen on the app application level, you know, we'll do what we can there. And, and, you know, there are deficiencies. It's not the best privacy tool, but where the deficiencies lie is where there's opportunity to create value and where there's opportunity to create, you know, uh, improvements in people and the way people interact with things. And that's where, where we wanted to be. Um, so, okay. Thank you. I do have a question from a viewer. Uh, he asks that, uh, they see the transaction Tenna open source code for the software, but not for the hardware design. Does the, uh, hardware design also exist in the open source area? Uh, I I'm not 100% sure. You'd have to ask the Gotenna people on that. I know that um, Richard Myers, who's who's quite involved in the in the Bitcoin community, is their kind of liaison. Um, and I think he was talking about trying to get them to open source that last we talked about it like a couple of years ago. So I don't know where that where that lies. Um, but we're more than willing to work with any um, uh, mesh network providers or hardware providers who want to tie in to what we're doing with the offline stuff. Cool deal. Yeah, um, I have another question. Where is Samurai legally based? We're all over the place. Uh, we have no, we have no um, corporate headquarters. Um, we are in Europe and the US and Asia, primarily. Cool deal. And uh, I assume most of you guys are anonymous, if not all of you. <laughs> I think all of us are. Um, I think all of us are, and it, you know, it's not it's not a hard and fast rule. It's kind of you know, it's up to the the person who contributes what how how associated they want to be. Um, we kind of want to practice what we preach, uh, mm. and and we do think that everyone should should have a good read of uh, True Names by Bernard Revenge. That's why it's in the uh, in the presentation. It's one of the early cypherpunk um, novels, and it, it gives a great insight into the way these guys were were thinking about how this plays out in the in the early '90s, um, and seeing how how it did play out in 2020. Um, so, so one question, kind of piggybacking off of my first question of like um, the the general 
uh, thoughts of the Bitcoin community on the privacy implementations and protocols like you guys have on a day to day basis. Does it more feel like a, an uphill battle or does it seem like, you know, the uphill battle was kind of before and now we're we're either coasting or things are, are moving along at a, at a quicker clip than they were before? Just like, yeah. What, what does the future hold for for Bitcoin privacy? Um. Well, it depends on the day. Some days it is up uphill battle. <laughs> it, it depends. I'm probably it's going to probably be one of those days in the next few days because the mob is going to be pissed that I'm on a Monero podcast or a Monero uh, event. Um, you know, I don't. I don't think it's. I think that if we're if we're zooming out and we're looking at all that we have achieved. Um, as first starting as a two-man team and and now even with nine people it's a very small team um i think it's been it's been enormous and and i can only be if if that's all we've ever done i think i can be very very proud and and the whole team should be very proud of of what we've been able to do and 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 primarily i think we've been the only ones to carry the the torch of of privacy on bitcoin um after dark wallet kind of went away you know we we picked up that 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 torch and we haven't let it go and i think that i think that a lot of people in the bitcoin community and a lot of powerful people in the bitcoin community would very much prefer that we let go of that torch and just shut up um you know we didn't cheer lightning network in fact we actively you know spoke against it we didn't cheer liquid when blockstream released that like we were supposed to uh we haven't you know, we haven't followed the narrative and that's pissed off, you know, very powerful people. So we have our fair share of enemies and that kind of gets tiring. But again, zooming out, that's inconsequential. It doesn't matter. What we've built has impacted so many more people and um, and hopefully we'll continue to do so in in the future. Sure. And, if, and if it's to answer your question most directly, our usage is growing. We have growing number of installs month over month and we have growing number of liquidity being added to um whirlpool coin join month over month so people are using the software and they're using it more than they did previously and that's true every month so i think that's a that's a very good indicator that you know we're doing something right and then there is a desire for privacy on bitcoin Okay, we do have one question from a little bit earlier, and I know there may be some bad blood with this one, or you got if it's too long, you don't want to answer. It's totally fine. But one person asks, "Why not Wasabi?" So, what's the deal with Wasabi? You said you feel like you guys are the only ones carrying this torch. Um, what what exactly about Wasabi kind of precludes them from that as well? Or yeah, well, I mean, it's not look, it's no secret we've been pretty public about the issues that we found in Wasabi. You know, one of the things I didn't get into the presentation because I thought it was getting too long was um, the the research stuff that we do with OXT, which is an analysis platform that we acquired in 2017. Um, we very one of our proudest achievements is we were able to acquire that instead of Chain Analysis acquiring it, which they tried to. Um, you know, we got that and we made it made we made sure that was uh, publicly available to all users for free, so they could have the same type of tools that their adversaries have. Um, and as part of that, uh, acquiring that strategically, it was to buff up our research and try to break our stuff and see where, you know, where the weaknesses lie. Uh, you know, in doing that, we've also looked at other projects, the Join Market and Wasabi being the two that we've looked at. And Wasabi in particular has numerous severe architectural deficiencies. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not going to get deeply into it, but we've published all our research. You can go onto my Medium account. I have all the links are there. You can go onto OXT, uh, research.oxt, uh, dot me. You can read the last vulnerability and it will probably be the last vulnerability we ever published about Wasabi because it was, it was a serious, it, it is a serious issue. They haven't fixed it, which results in, in um, coin selection being deterministic for the for the wallet, which is serious. Like that's not a good thing. You don't want anything deterministic in your coin join implementation. And it was an easy fix, and they've just they've refused to fix it. Um, that was the last most egregious thing. Um, and you know, at that point, what what more can you say? 
you know, uh, so we're not going to say anymore. And, and I think we've said enough. If you, if you do your research and you decide that Wasabi is, a, is an implementation that you want to use, then, then go for it. Cool deal. Thanks. Uh, one more question. Uh, when XMR in Samurai Wallet? <laughs> uh, well, one of the earliest feature ideas we had, believe it or not, was, was making Samurai a multi-wallet with Bitcoin and Monero. Um, what we wanted, we wanted to use Monero primarily um, to hop off the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain and hop back in at a later date. Um, it was very early back then. We were very naive. We thought that Monero was just one of the, you know, the carbon copies of Bitcoin, like a Litecoin or something that you could just pretty much copy paste some stuff in the wallet and you're good to go. No, it's a whole, it's its own beast. Uh, it requires its own infrastructure, and that's when we gained a lot of respect for the project actually. But we we realized that look, we need to be we need to be Monero guys to to do this properly. We're not Monero guys, um, so let's the, let the Monero guys do that. With the recent uh, atomic swap stuff happening in the uh, Monero side of things, we're looking at that very, very closely. We're very interested in that. We can see a lot of crossover and a lot of ways that can tie in beautifully into our existing um, infrastructure. So in some in some way, maybe sooner than you think. <laughs> we'll see. Cool, cool. So then, just so like potentially have something on the app that automatically sets up all of the multi sig addresses right. and do, do, does this all in the background. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, essentially, the original idea, but now it's actually, you know, more possible without sure. custody and without, you know, forwarding payments or doing weird things, hoping that, you know, this, this, whatever service out in Panama pays out properly, you know. Sure. Well, uh, yeah, please do pursue that if you guys don't feel that you are alienated enough from the Bitcoin community at large enough. I definitely, I definitely think that's one of the common points that Monero people have is, you know, a lot of Monero people do have respect for Bitcoin and, and um, so, you know, some people don't. But, you know, there, there is this idea that we as Monero people, we are in the shit coin, right? We have become no. the shit coin. And, and so we, we are definitely not within the traditional Bitcoin narrative that, uh, that the big the the self proclaimed big wigs uh, like to say so yeah not at all we feel um, you there not at all uh, yeah you know in fact those those people that would that would say that uh, we don't respect those people at all uh, so I don't really we don't really care what they have to say and yeah you know every time that the outrage machine turns on for us yeah it's annoying to deal with on a personal level but our numbers go skyrocketing when that happens hmm. like you know we get hockey sticks so. By all means, give us the press. People, people need to hear about us. So, <laughs> even, you know, even, it, it, there's no such thing as bad press, right? Sure. Um, so, we'll we'll take the outrage if if it makes sense from a product level. If it makes sense for enabling the you know the digital safe haven, like I said, it's not a maximalism thing. It's which tools do the job, and uh, you know, there uh, Monero is a tool in the arsenal, as is Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I gave a talk about privacy yesterday, and I talked very much about a privacy tool belt. How there's no one app that's a one-stop shop that's the silver bullet, you know, and make you completely private. Exactly, it's a, it's a plethora of things. Um, I got one more thing over here. A shameless request from an electronics enthusiast: Please implement RFID or NFC wallet access in Samurai, kind of like the Maneruyo wallet for Android does. We will look at that. Um, okay. <laughs> We've done, we did, I think we had NFC in the first alpha version. I have to check with uh, Samurai Dev, but I think we did have that uh, originally. Um, and I think we just took it out because it was not many people were using it or it was just you know, clutter or something, or maybe Android changed a permission or something, but we'll look, we'll look into it again. Sure. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to tell this Monero village? Um, any last words from you? No, uh, I think I uh, just want to again say thank you uh, for having us. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed the talk and and uh, I hope to to do something like this again with you guys. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for, for getting back to me and, and for doing this. Uh, thrilled to have you on. I, 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 was, I, was, I found it interesting and uh, I'm pretty sure everyone else did as well. We have some of the higher viewer counts of today. So Sweet. 13 Vito. Um, with that, I can go ahead and let you go do your samurai wallet things. Um, <laughs> go check the fallout on Twitter. 
That's what yes, I'll do. Exactly. See how much reing is going on behind the scenes these days. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that's a wrap on us, not just with this talk, 